we have our next session. We are honored to showcase a passionate STEM, STEM educator with more than two decades of aviation experience. He has been leveraging his industry knowledge to ignite student curiosity through STEM education, supporting teachers and empowering corporate learning experiences so that so they can showcase their capacity for innovation. He is Grand Middle Court representing Australia. His session title is My Cockpit to Your Classroom. Hello, Cran. How are you? Oh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning to wherever you may all be. Thank you all very much for having me here today. Um, hey, Gav, how are you, mate? Doing good? That's what I like. A thumbs up. That works. Very good. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me. Now I'm going to go start straight into it. I've just got to work out this screen share arrangement to make sure we're all getting the right thing. Uh, Anusha, can you please tell me if that comes up properly? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you, Craig. Okay, I should see a yeah, picture of this, uh, yeah, my ugly mug in the flight deck of an Airbus 320. All right, <clears throat> that's me. Uh, okay, guys, so again, big shout out to uh, Gav and Anoush. You're doing an absolutely sensational job here at Education Influence, and thank you all very much for having me. Uh, right now, I'm actually in uh, the desert of Western Australia in a little town in the Pilbara region called Newman, out here working with the Indigenous students. So... I, um, so far, so good. The internet's okay. So fingers crossed we'll keep going. So my passion, my adventure, this is sort of my uh, story and some of the experiences I've been through and then how you can implement these into your classroom. So uh, making sure this works. So, all right, there's a big one. Normally, when I'm doing teacher professional development, I ask everyone to speak that out in a big, loud voice. Obviously, it's not going to work here tonight. If your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. The reason I'm doing what I'm doing now is, well, there's, there's a couple of reasons, but the main one is there was no one like Gavin. There was no one like Anusha. There was no one like myself who, who were going into schools and telling young people how amazing that they could be. So that's part of my reason why I'm doing this. So... Q&A. Now, I know it's at the wrong end for Q&A, but I also make a point of it right now. Note your cues. Note your cues so I can give you the ace. This is a call to action for your, your Q&A session. So uh, rather to avoid the stunned silence at the end of the session, write down your questions so that I can assist you at the end of our uh, talk today. Who invented the aerofoil? Okay, can anyone put it into the chat? Uh, the... Um, who do you think invented the aerofoil? It can be people from a particular country. It can be an individual. Some of you may actually know the correct answer. So uh, officially, who, who invented the aerofoil, the, the aircraft wing? Um, Anusha, if you can have a look at the chat, see if anyone comes up with any ideas and let me know, please. Right, teacher Nissi Pearl writes, Wright Brothers. Wright Brothers, okay. Well, the Wright Brothers were credited with the first successful aircraft. However, they didn't... They didn't uh, uh, invent the wing. The wing or the aerofoil was uh, developed far earlier, a long time before the Wright brothers were. So officially, uh, sorry, you got any more there, Anish? I see a couple more come up in the chats. No, not, at, not okay. at the moment. Officially, it's that gentleman, Sir George Cayley, an English baron. He came up with the idea. It's, as you can see from that description, it's a flat lower surface, curved upper surface. And it was George Cayley, officially. Unofficially, it was the First Nations people of Australia. If you look at the cross section of a boomerang, you will notice that it has a flat lower surface and a curved upper surface, exactly the same profile, or very, very similar profile to the modern aircraft wing. I really enjoy sharing that story because the uh, First Nations and Indigenous people of Australia tend not to get that acknowledgement that uh, they are our first aerospace engineers in Australia. And they developed the aerofoil and perfected it millennia, millennia before Sir George Cayley, who gets the official credit for it. Who do we think that little tacker is? Anyone coming up in the, the uh, chat there? Uh, Nisha? Of course, most of you think it's me. So yeah, that's a few weeks ago now. That's about 42 years ago. Well, actually, I haven't rise, it's, is it Jeff Bezos? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, Jeff Bezos is much better looking than I am. So no, that, that's me uh, about four decades ago. 
And you see, I've been around airplanes my entire life. My father was a pilot. My grandfather was a pilot. And the photo on the right there is the very first time I went in an airplane at the age of about four. And I was too little to see out the window. So my father undid my seatbelt so I could stand on the seat and see out the window. And from the, I can still remember it. And from that moment, I knew that was where I belonged. I belonged on the flight deck. I belonged in the cockpit. The sky was home. That's, I never, ever, ever, ever wanted to do anything else but fly airplanes. And that's where it went. And it shortly came as a consequence that so I didn't miss much. If something flew over, I saw it. Please don't ask me what look my mother was going for with the long socks. I've got no idea. But anyway, maybe it was just what happened in the early 80s. Little boys wore long socks. I don't know. But anyway, there you go. As I grew up, I used to build model airplanes with my dad. I was in the Australian Air League, which is like a very you know junior air force for, uh, for little people. Started learning to fly at the age of 14 uh, as afternoon school sport. I uh, went down to the local airfield and uh, started flying uh, aeroplanes there during when all the other students were at sport with a handful of other students. And uh, my first solo was Anzac Day 1997, or for those who are not familiar with the Anzac Day date, this is the 25th of April 1997, I flew an aeroplane by myself for the first time. The instructor jumped out and said, right, take it for a circuit by yourself, which is exactly uh, what I did. And a thrill beyond thrills you never forget your first solo and also managed to for that year i was top student pilot of the year uh, when i uh, in graduated in 1997 that's the same year i graduated high school i used to actually take my teachers from school flying you see for one reason i needed someone who had a car and a driver's license to get me to the airport because i was allowed to fly airplanes but i was not allowed to drive cars so i wanted to take my teachers flying but mainly well, for one reason i needed them to get me to the airport you see because uh, i couldn't drive a car now, flying is very expensive and it's just something I wanted to do, but I had to find a way to pay for it. So I was working uh, full time in a real estate office and doing their administration stuff. And at one stage, I was delivering pizzas at night in a desperate attempt to save up money. And at this particular real estate office, they had the mascot of this uh, big teddy bear. Guess who had to wear the bear suit? So someone had to draw the short straw and it was me who had to wear the bear suit. Ironically, it's interesting to think back now that I was doing that in my early 20s and working with children. I, it was just a means to get money to learn how to fly, but I was actually working with children, which as my career has progressed, is a, it's a bit interesting to think about. So yeah, wore the big fluffy teddy bear suit. Operation Wishmaker. Again, I, I've always had this, this innate sense, to, I wanted to help people. And while I was learning to fly, a good friend of mine and I, um, Anthony Sturgis, he's now a captain with Alliance Airlines. We, um, we got ourselves an aeroplane. We raised $5,000 for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. We set a new world record. We did 344 takeoffs and landings in a 24 hour period. And um, raising money for this uh, little girl, Paige, she had a malignant brain tumor. And uh, through the Make-A-Wish Foundation, before she got too ill, she wanted to go on a shopping spree. And we raised the money for Paige to have her shopping spree uh, before she got too ill. That was just some of the things we just we just wanted to help people out. Also got to fly airplanes that don't even have engines. I got to do gliding. That was a very good skill to have uh, because every landing is a forced landing. You don't have a go around capability. So you, you um, get to be very good. You, it really enhances your judgment. Eventually I got my learner's permit, which was my commercial pilot's license and my instrument rating. So I could fly in bad weather and actually go out and earn money uh, flying airplanes. You know, those are two of my instructors and one of the uh, um, examiners I flew with. And I got my first job uh, in Australia where the Red Cross is way up in the Gulf country there at a cattle property called Augustus Downs. So my job was to fly the aeroplane chasing cows, mustering cattle. And um, I did 700 hours flying in 10 months, so which was, oh, I loved every second of the flying. It was great fun. Um, and... Uh, you got to learn a lot of things. Like I say, this is an adventure. And I think with young people these days, they, they want to get the next best thing. They want to get the shiny thing. You've got to enjoy the journey along the way. And while I was doing this job, I got to learn how to drive a truck. I got a heavy rigid truck license. I went to deal with um, interesting people. The One of the jackaroos I was living with asked me how to spell it. And I'm not lying. No word of a lie. He asked me how to spell it, I-T. And he said, does it start with a T or an I? And on the inside, I was thinking, you've got to be joking, but having to live and work with that same group of people, you have to be very diplomatic. So there's skills you, you generate and learn along the way. 
um, based out of that tiny little airstrip there, up li quite literally in the middle of nowhere. Now, there's the road, and that's the highway between Work and Wills Three Ways and Gregory Downs. And there is a zebra crossing, what appears to be a zebra crossing right in the middle of this highway, going from nowhere to nowhere, from one cow paddock to another cow paddock. Throw it in the comments. What do you think that zebra crossing in the middle of a cow paddock is for? Have you got any comments there, Anisha? Don't be shy. <laughs> the zebra crossing for the cows, okay. And taxi from me. Uh, all right, any other suggestions? Ducks. <laughs> ducks, all right, zebra crossing for ducks. There's not many ducks out there because there's not much water. And okay. Claudina writes runway. That's right, that's what it is. It's the piano keys. If you look at the end of every major runway, you'll see the piano keys, and that's what marks the end of the runway. What it is, it's an all weather runway for the Royal Flying Doctor Service. So, when you're out in the Australian outback and the, uh, the dirt runways can get flooded, and when they, they can take days and days to dry, so that the Royal Flying Doctor Service have an all weather landing capability, they widen the road slightly. They put little turning um, nodes at the end of each runway and they put the piano keys down. And so it's an all weather runway used for Royal Flying Doctor Service. And you see them every, every couple of hundred kilometers as you're driving around the Queensland outback. I was fortunate I flew with the, the pilot who came up with the idea many, many years before I flew with him when he was at the Flying Doctors. Then I got my second job up in the, uh, the Kimberley region of Western Australia. I was flying charter aircraft, so slightly bigger aeroplanes. And I had to fly to that little airstrip from Cockatoo Island to Coolan Island. So two flights in the morning, two flights in the afternoon, taking an exploration drill team. Now, that looks like a reasonably benign airstrip until you see the other end. That's a 400 foot drop straight into the water. So we had to wear what we call halley vests, which were a life jacket, which you wore so like a bum bag, but you grabbed it and threw it straight over your head. Because if we had an engine failure after takeoff, the options were very, very limited. I remember one afternoon, again, this is that adventure you enjoy along the way. I took off and I looked down on the, uh, the water and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but just around here, I saw a big manta ray doing loops, loop the loops in the water. Really, really cool. Cyclone Faye, we got uh, stuck on this island. We had the aeroplane, uh, there was no hangar. We thought, right, first thing tomorrow morning, we're gonna get the aeroplane out down to Derby and lock it away in a hangar. We didn't make it till tomorrow morning. The cyclone came in overnight and we were stuck. We had no hangar, the aeroplane was completely exposed and this, the new, the other chap pilot that was up there were both the new guys. We thought, heck, if, we, if this aeroplane gets damaged, we won't have a job. We have to find a way to protect it. So we built a hangar using two dump trucks from the mine. Now, as silly as that looks, it did the job. And teachers, this is what STEM is. It's looking at everything around you and seeing it as a potential resource. As silly as it looked, two dump trucks protected the aeroplane. So they were parked on the upwind side of the aeroplane and they protected the uh, aircraft from the worst of the weather. And it was, aside from being completely saturated and the carpets had to come out, it was undamaged. So um, this is STEM, looking at everything as a potential resource and how you can make it work. Um, you get to take some really interesting cargo uh, when you're in general aviation. So, um, and when you say interesting, I can assure you that black car is not a black limousine. That black car had interesting cargo indeed. So we have to do what we call the coffin runs. Now the new kid on the block always gets the jobs that no other pilot wants. And it's a real practical joke, which they play on the new pilot. And guess who the new pilot was? It was yours truly. This flight, the photo you see on the right, um, I was loading the coffin into the aeroplane. I had, one of the other pilots was there. So I, ha I had the, the end with the head and he had the end with the feet. And we we're jostling around, trying to fit it into the aeroplane. When all of a sudden I got this blast of cold air straight up my right arm when the lid came loose. And oh, I don't swear much, but I swore that afternoon because I got one heck of a fright. And the undertaker had forgotten to pass on quite a vital piece of information. It was meant to be an open casket ceremony. His procedure, you don't screw on the lid. So the lid was loose. They didn't tell us that. And about two minutes after we got the coffin into the, into the aeroplane, he came up and gave me the lids to screw the, sorry, gave me the screws to uh, secure the lid on the coffin. I thought, well, two minutes ago, they would have been really useful. The other thing they don't tell you, when you're the new kid on the block, 
is that the body comes fresh from the morgue. So decomposition hasn't begun to take place. So the larynx is still intact. As the aeroplane climbs, pressure decreases, the air pressure. There's still air trapped inside the body. That air has to escape. So you're flying along, all happy, going along, and you start to hear this uh, uh, coming from the coffin. Of course, they don't tell the new guy, and you sit there and you absolutely, oh, what the, yeah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, expletive, expletive. The other thing, depending on where the air is trapped, you can also, <coughs> pardon me, let go at the other end. So I've got to be honest, flying around a belching flatulent corpse was not exactly my idea of a good time. However, I had one of those with lots of empty pages. And so I had to come up with a way. And <laughs> if I didn't do the job, there was plenty of other guys lined up to, to do that. Also started to fly twin engine aircraft when I was in Western Australia. So multi-engine aircraft, you have to have so many hours single engine aeroplanes and so many hours multi-engine aircraft before you move on to flying uh, in the airlines. So I've got to fly the twins on the mail runs. This is out in uh, Gibb River, the old Padre had come out and pumped the fuel for me out of a drum when we refueled up there. I remember th at this particular place one day in the middle of summer, I uh, looked at the outside air temperature and I think it was something like 46 degrees. I remember stepping out into 46 degrees and it felt cooler. So I've got no idea how hot it was inside the aeroplane because this aeroplane was designed to fly around the British Isles, not the uh, Outback Australia. I uh, then was transferred down to Port Hedland, still in Western Australia, down to Pilbara. And that was cool. I enjoyed Port Hedland. There was um, four pilots. We all got along well. All our girls got along well. We didn't have any children at that stage. So we didn't need an excuse for a party. Started to fly more sophisticated aeroplanes and faster aeroplanes like you see here with the Chieftain. Used to do clinic runs with the Royal Flying Doctor Service with that, uh, those aircraft. And uh, got a pretty cool day at the office when we had a squadron of F-18 Hornets come in to refuel. And anyway, we thought that was just plain cool. So we got a bit cheeky, you see. Decided to pose up in front of these hornets thinking, how cool are we? But then we thought, no, 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 no. We can do better than that. We can, we can turn up this cheeky level, really crank it up, you see. So we parked our aeroplane right in front of the hornets. Thinking, how cool are we? Now, you see how the hornets have got their canopies up? We opened our crew door. We thought, we are so cool. Anyway, these are the funny things you do along your career and just have fun with it. Eventually, you got my job back in Brisbane, <coughs> pardon me, with Qantas Link flying the Dash 8s. Absolutely love that job. Um, it was a really personal job. We, you know, first name basis with the refuelers and all the ground staff. I really, really enjoyed that job. Uh, it was also the first time I got to have a job flying a uh, real simulator. So I'm qualified on four, um, four different air airliners. And I got the qualification to fly those aeroplanes having never flown the real aeroplane. The simulator reproduces it that well that you can get the qualification having never flown the real aeroplane. Uh, I also got to work with my dad at um, Qantas Link. So he was a maintenance engineer. Uh, the very last day he retired, uh, the last aeroplane he dispatched I was operating, which was by, uh, by sheer coincidence, which was pretty cool. Um, now, three words. Three words no pilot ever, ever, ever wants to say, but has to be ready to say them at a moment's notice. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Imminent life-threatening danger. That is the only time you use that phrase when things are really going to go down the tube. I came so close to having to do that when I was at Qantas Link. <clears throat> That's the caution and warning panel. The red ones are bad, the uh, amber ones are urgent, but not catastrophic. Anyway, we got that one. Smoke. Of all the emergencies you have to deal with, the one we just do not want to have to deal with is smoke. And that was smoke in the cargo hold. First thing we do is we put our oxygen masks on so that if the smoke comes into the cockpit, at least we can still breathe. Anyway, it came on and we were about ready to declare a full blind emergency. And when you declare an emergency, it's a big deal. The police are sent out, they shut down all of them, put up roadblocks between the airport and the hospitals. They get every available ambulance out to the airport. They get extra doctors and nurses on. It's a huge deal if you declare an emergency. And we were this close because the light went out. Flick back on again, and then it went out. 
There is a reason you're told to put the lids on your deodorant. That is all it was. Someone didn't put the lid on their deodorant and the little pressure pack got depressed, filled the cargo hold full of deodorant and activated the smoke sensor. So we nearly declared a full-blown emergency because of someone's deodorant. The cargo hold smelled beautiful, but yeah, pretty serious that one. Dreams without goals are fantasies. We've got to emphasize goals to young people. They can have their dreams, but you've got to have goals. For some kids, the goal might just be getting to school that day. So you dream your dreams, you set your goals, you achieve your goals, and then you live your dreams. You've got to set goals. It is so important you have those goals set. My first jet got to fly the Airbus 320. Um, up until then, all the aeroplanes I'd flown have been conventional. There's just cables and pulleys and so forth. This was a computerized aeroplane. <clears throat> so it was, it was a lot to get your head around flying an Airbus for the first time. I also did a lot of back of the clock flying from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And um, this is coming back from Perth to Brisbane early one morning, just north of Adelaide at sunrise. Uh, beautiful sight, but I missed it because I was asleep. Now, isn't that just so reassuring that the pilot sitting up the front of you wonderful fair paying passengers who are paying my wages is asleep at the controls. But that is absolutely normal. It is absolutely normal and it is a standard procedure called controlled rest. You physically can't keep your eyes open when it's smooth and the autopilot's on, everything's just humming along. You can't do it. So what we do, we have controlled rest. How it works is every, we tell the cabin crew we're doing it and obviously not both pilots sleep at the same time. And uh, every half an hour, the pilots call the cabin crew. And if the cabin crew don't hear from us, they call the flight deck. And that's the procedure we have in place. So we can have a bit of a kip. So we're alert for the descent and landing. The A330, absolutely love flying that airplane. That's the most, that's my favorite jet, the Airbus A330. It's a 240 ton puppy dog. It was an absolutely beautiful machine to fly. Um, this photo was taken by an Air New Guinea pilot 2,000 feet below us, and I'm actually flying the aeroplane there. That's just um, south of Guam on our way to Tokyo. It's not too often you actually get photos of an aeroplane where you're flying. Usually you're the one taking the photos, but this chapman was very good with, the, um, with his uh, photography and emailed me the photo with the contrails and so forth behind it. That was pretty cool. Now, the A330 was the closest I came to losing an engine. We um, had a bird strike out of the Gold Coast early one morning. And I, um, I looked up and I see this flock of magpie in front of us. And I thought, oh man, we're gonna, we're gonna hit. And sure enough, we did bang, 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 all down the right-hand side of the airplane. I looked over and saw a uh, instant um, spike in one of the engine instruments. And I thought, oh, we're gonna lose the right-hand engine here. And anyway, it stabilized, but there is a very, very, very reliable way of knowing whether you've taken a bird down the core of the engine. Most of the air you see that goes in that engine gets bypassed. Only about 20, 30% of it goes through the engine. But if a bird does go down through the core, the reliable way of knowing is that the entire airplane starts to smell like roast chicken because the engine gets very hot. And so we pump air, air off the engine to pressurize the cabin. We can filter out the particulates, but we can't filter out the smell. So if the aeroplane starts to smell like grandma's place on Sunday afternoon roast, you know it's because you've taken a bird down the core of the engine. Got to fly some pretty cool places. This is Bali on New Year's Day. I landed at Bali, Tempasar Bali at six minutes to midnight. There's oh, fireworks and strobe lights were about 200 miles out. We could see them was going absolutely berserk. And we were so close and we landed, we were taxiing in. We could hear the bangs of the fireworks in the cockpit with the engines running. Never, ever, ever happened in Australia. Got to fly this other pretty cool machine as well. Got to fly the Air, um, Boeing 787. Fastest aeroplane I've ever flown. We got it to 94%, sorry, 93% of the speed of sound one night. Um, I night had a, um, a flight attendant who was a good photographer and uh, she wasn't needed in the cabin. So she took these photos going into Narita and uh, that's Mount Fuji on the left there. And you've got to be careful that slam dunk is that you could be caught high and fast and there's a real, you have to really be on the RA game going into Narita because they could um, uh, cut you in short and you could be too high and too fast to configure. Then you, all you have to do is go around and have another go, which uses a lot of fuel. So we always have to be prepared for it. And uh, that's what we see on final approach landing in 1-6 uh, left at, uh, at Narita, Tokyo. So it's pretty cool. And this was a lot of fun. So 
up until this point, you probably, some of you may notice I had only three bars on my shoulder. I was a, uh, I was a first officer. My um, sim results were good. My assessments for my emergency procedures and my uh, line checks were good. I've been put up for command upgrade to become a captain. And I was going to get that fourth bar. Then that happened. 20 January, 6th of January, 2020. I had to undergo neurosurgery. That spot you can see circled is an arachnoid cystic lesion. It was discovered by accident. It was embedded so deep in my brain, I had to be given a, a drug to shrink my brain so the surgeon could get to it to drain it. I was in intensive care, I think for four days. Honestly, I don't remember very much of it. Um, I was finally discharged from hospital. On the way home from hospital, I sustained a seizure back to hospital via an ambulance. And that's left me with what appears to be permanent brain damage. So I can now no longer fly airplanes. That has to be the worst thing you can tell a pilot, especially someone like me. You've seen, you saw the photos all my life. All I ever, ever, ever wanted to do was fly airplanes. And then that was that taken away from me. So what do I do? Honestly, what do I do? I have to find a new reason to get out of bed in the morning. I have to find a new why. And the reason I do it is because of all of you and of every other student I speak to. That's my why. And this is where we came up with It's Rocket Science Adventures. So it was started in 2015. I flew to an international rocketry meet and I saw a little, little tiny school with a handful of kids and one or two teachers. And I thought, okay, I've got to be able to take this to them. And so that's where my little business kicked off. That was the embryonic moment. And this is where we started its rocket science adventures with young people building their rockets, launching them, getting them excited about their learning, getting them really thinking about how amazing they can be with a smart device they've got between their ears. I want to get kids away from these things. So using that smart device they got between their ears, they can achieve amazing, amazing, amazing things. Also quite heavily involved with the Indigenous communities of Australia, flying out bush to these tiny little schools. You barely have a handful of kids. I went mean, to one school that had six students, but that's the, what we you know, get out there to show these young kids they can have the same experience. This young lady, she'd never seen an aeroplane before that we were aware of. Her name's Dakota. And we plonked her in the front seat of that, that aeroplane and she saw that smile and the thumbs up and she just that's why I do what I do, to put smiles on little people's faces and tell them they can be amazing, making sure these young people know they can believe in themselves. That's the important part. And as educators, I frankly think that is the most important part of our job, making sure these young people believe in themselves. Recently, I did a, uh, a job down in Bathurst and I was invited by one of the teachers to look at some of the, uh, the work they did. And they did a, uh, they wrote some notes after and. Uh, I, I saw these and that just makes me feel as though I'm really am making a difference. And this little young man here, his name's Will. And having said that, we didn't call him Will because we think he looks like Iceman from Top Gun. He's like a little mini Val Kilmer. So for the rest of the day, we started calling him Iceman and he absolutely loved it. So again, smiles and words like that. That's my why. That's why I get out of bed in the morning. 28 years, nearly... Uh, uh, 9,000 hours in my logbook, I've only flown with eight, sorry, nine female captains, nine female captains in my entire career. So I am really passionate about pushing and getting young, young women to think about where they can go. There's absolutely no reason why young women can't be fast jet fighter pilots, can't be flying, you know, heavy jet, the heavy jet commanders. There's no reason whatsoever. So I've really got a passion about inspiring young women. This gentleman in the middle is uh, astronaut Charlie Duke. He was the youngest astronaut to walk on the moon. And I, I got to meet him with a good friend of mine, Blake Nikolic, is the owner of Black Sky Aerospace. We got to meet him one night here in Brisbane. You get to meet some other pretty cool people. That's that lady on my um, on the left of the screen there. That's Mary Ellen Webber. She flew on two space shuttle missions in the uh, early 2000s. And that's Nat Davy. She's a retired Navy helicopter pilot. And again, very passionate about getting young people into aerospace. So we were at a careers day. And um, we had a great day that day. Black Sky Aerospace is a company I STEM outreach for. They launched Australia's very first commercial rocket. 
and they're also poised to launch Australia's very first rocket to space. There's never been an Australian made rocket go to space. And I want to be able to live stream that into as many classrooms as I can. So Anusha, you and I'll be talking about that because I want as many young people to see this. It'll never happen again. Australia's very first rocket to go to space. So Gavin, Anusha, we need to be talking. And um, this was uh, at that commercial launch and had my logo on the rocket, which was pretty cool. And you see in the nose cone there is an Indigenous artwork. This uh, um, Aboriginal chap is uh, Jawa Inapingu, and he launched one of our rockets and he took it home to his young people in his school, which uh, was pretty amazing. And it was his sister that did the artwork that went on the nose cone of that rocket. Now, this is what I wish I'd been told when I was in primary school. I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Thomas Anderson. Failure is success in progress. Albert Einstein. Perfection simply does not exist. Without imperfection, neither you nor I would exist. Professor Stephen Hawking. Now, I'm quite certain we've all said that. I'm quite certain we've all said practice makes perfect. Don't ever say it again. That is the biggest lie in society. Don't ever, ever, ever say that again. Don't tell your students that. Don't expect your students to say that. Don't ever say that phrase again. It's an absolute lie. I'll tell you why. That's a simulator. And you can see the chap sitting behind. He can fail engines. He can create smoke. He can ice up the wings. He can make life really interesting in the simulator. And I would... Every aeroplane has a list of emergency memory items, items and procedures you've got to know from memory. There's no excuse for not knowing them. I recorded them on my phone. So as I was driving to work, I'd listen to them. So they were constantly at the forefront of my mind. And I was trying to be perfect. What I didn't realize was at the time, I knew them extremely well. I knew them extremely well when I was driving the car. When I got into the simulator, the dynamic changed. And because the dynamic changed, I'd make a little mistake. I'd start to kick myself and say, Cran, you idiot, you know this procedure. Why did you do that? I was then distracted. I'd make another mistake. I'd start kicking myself again. I'd get really frustrated. It was very, very unhealthy. And my performance showed. I never failed a sim, but I was, it, it got to the point where I was really stressing a ridiculous amount about it. So I had to change the way I looked, looked it towards my sim. I started to allow myself an error budget. I would go into a sim and I would say, I'm going to completely and utterly stuff up, destroy, wreck 20% of it. We're going to nail 80. Allowing your students to make mistakes is absolutely vital. You've got to let students realize they're allowed to make mistakes and perfection and striving for perfection is really, really unhealthy. So if practice doesn't make perfect, what does practice do? I believe practice creates confidence. Practice creates confidence. That's the phrase you need to say. When you're speaking of practice, it creates confidence. The benefit of that is you'll be confident with the negative outcomes. Your students will be confident with the negative outcomes and see them as learning potential. We still stigmatize failure as a bad thing. We have to embrace failure. If we're not aiming for perfection, what do we aim for? We aim for progress, not perfection. You will always achieve progress. You will always achieve progress. You set your goal and you achieve your goal. Little goals. Right? I'm going to do two hours study on history. All right, or I'm going to do half an hour in history and 40 minutes on maths. Little goals. Achieve those little goals and you achieve the progress. It won't be perfect. There's no such thing as perfection. You might achieve what you thought was perfection, but then it won't be good enough. You'll just get more and more critical of yourself. Aim for progress, not perfection. The comfort zone. It's a beautiful place. We all love going to the comfort zone. However, you will never achieve anything substantial when you stay in the comfort zone. And this is where we need to show our students it's okay to go into the fear zone, where you, you, you can talk yourself out of things, you find excuses, you lack self-confidence. That is absolutely normal, and it is absolutely okay. You're allowed to feel uncomfortable. 
In fact, you will never achieve anything if you don't feel uncomfortable. That's part of learning. You will make mistakes. That's where you learn. Move into the learning zone. That's when you start to find, figure out how you can deal with it. Your confidence builds, you get to the growth zone, which then becomes your new learning zone. No, oh, sorry, your new comfort zone. So showing your students to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it is perfectly okay to be uncomfortable. That's part of it, all right? That uncomfortable feeling, that's normal. That means you're learning. And that's great. That's a positive thing. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, you're not learning. Fail the word to be unsuccessful in achieving one's goal. I prefer the acronym. It means first attempt in learning. Embracing failure. We still, I can't speak for the rest of the world, but definitely in Australia, we're still stigmatizing failure as a bad thing, a bad thing which should be avoided. And that's absolutely wrong. You need to be embracing failure because that's where the lessons are. Comfortable, you know, successful people are comfortable with failure. They will seek failure because they'll extract the lessons from the failure and they'll progress far, far, far quicker than someone trying to avoid failure. You need to embrace failure. And this is another one. Everyone says the more you do something, the easier it gets. Well, I don't believe that either because the task never changes. It never, ever gets easier. What does happen, you get better. That is what really happens. That is what really happens. The task itself never changes. What happens is you get better. So guys, it's up to you for Q&A. Scan that QR code. Let's connect on LinkedIn. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as Gavin and Nusha are now pretty active on LinkedIn. Same with Yvonne. I'm on there pretty much every day. So now it's time for you to pose the questions to me. I'm happy to help. Uh, as long as you like any questions about anything, careers in aviation, anything at all, please go right ahead. So I'll hand it over to Anusha with your questions. Thank you for your fun and inspiring session, Grant. Thank you for sharing your legacy with us. It was very emotional and very inspiring. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And here we have people all over the world tuning in for you. And Ashish Powell writes, what is the best airplane you flew? And is there a <laughs> wide difference while flying an A320 compared to A380? Well, I've never flown a 380, um, but that, not really. Uh, that's what Airbus embraced. They wanted to be able to transition from one type to the other with minimal training. And that's exactly what I did. Like having flown the Airbus A320, moving to the A330, it was a step up, no doubt. However, the, it was so much easier because my muscle memory was the same. The switches and the controls were all in the same positions. So Airbus really embraced that and they've done that even up to the A380. The, um, the emergency procedures are all very, very similar, if not identical. So um, that, that's in terms of stepping between Airbus types, Boeing and Airbus, totally different, totally different. It's a completely different philosophy. Um, it takes a huge amount to transfer between those two. Um, in terms of my favorite airplane, like I said, the A330 is my favorite jet. Um, really enjoyed that one, but I've, I've flown little airplanes like the, you know, I had used to own a little RV 6A. That was a huge amount of fun. Little pocket rocket. I really enjoyed that airplane. So, um, yeah, Thank I you, hope I answered that question. Thank you, Fran. Yvonne Prinsler writes, how can underprivileged children with very limited resources available to them from other corners of the world be reached by your STEM STEM program in the future? Well, that's where Gav and I have been talking. We've got some plans in place. Um, when I do our rocket launching equipment, um, when I go to schools, we, we want to actually be able to send that and get that uh, packaged up. So uh, I'll be very shortly working on a new prototype where I can um, ship it. Because what we do with water and air propelled rocketry, it's the only form of rocketry that you can do which does not involve dangerous goods. So there's nothing flammable. There's no ignition sources. It's just soft drink bottles and compressed air. There's nothing uh, uh, dangerous in terms of its propellant. And it's the only form of rocketry that's like that. And so we can ship our, um, and post our equipment using standard shipping, which is a huge benefit because it's much cheaper and it can be put on aircraft, whereas flammable propellants must, can only be put onto the uh, thing, <coughs> um, to ships. But um, that's what we're working on at the moment. And then saying supported that with an on some online content as well. Thank you so much, 
Karen. We do have another question, and that's from me. The question mm -hmm. is, cockpit and classroom are far-fetched locations. Mm -hmm. How would you find interfaces between the uh, aerial world of cockpit? Like you've mentioned, stretch management, time, and communication, you know, with accuracy and always alert, being alert, vigilant, you know, multitasking, and the, and the terrestrial world of classroom. Well, I'm not very good at multitasking. I'm male, put it that way. <clears throat> Pardon me. When, when, I, when I see similarities between the flight deck and the classroom, it's, 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 it's on that philosophical level of assessment and training. Um, like I was taught through school to avoid failure and you didn't want to fail. We're, we're still stigmatizing that as a bad thing. Um, and I can speak from firsthand experience when I was flying an aircraft, which I was responsible for 200 plus people behind me, embracing failure is the way to go because that's when you learn. You become a far, far better operator when you're prepared to accept failure and learning from it. Obviously, you've got to meet the standard. You've got to meet the standard. And my what I considered a failure was very small. Um, you know, but you've got to be prepared to try something new. And particularly, you can extend that in the classroom um, with your artwork. I mean, if you're not prepared to fail, you will never, ever, ever come up with anything original. You've got to be prepared to fail. And that's how you learn. And breaking down that philosophical point is where I see the parallels between the cockpit and the classroom from an assessment and training point of view, because then you can embrace that and, and, and get people to accept that um, failure is a, is a good thing. Thank you, Grant. Thank you so much. Eric Codina writes, Questions, sorry. Hi, Kren. Hope you are doing well. I am currently approaching the end of my flight training, and I know that finding a first job is difficult for low climb pilots. Is there any advice you can give to finding that first job in GA in Australia? Oh, okay, GA in Australia. Starting first thing, piece of advice is, mate, just don't give up. Don't give up. You, it's going to get hard. You're going to feel disheartened. And you're going to have, you know, deal with people who. Uh, you're just rude, etc. It's just unfortunate, but just don't give up. Just do not give up. That's the most important thing is find that resilience and just keep going. Every month I would send out, I don't know how many resumes I would email out and every month I'd follow them up with a phone call. Getting out there and actually showing, um, you know, being Johnny on the spot um, can actually help. It's a whole lot easier now. There's a lot more jobs available in that GA world than there was when I went through. There was so many pilots looking for work. So in, in GA, uh, it, it is a little bit easier. And you've got to be prepared to do the, 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 the cruddy jobs. Like I was, when, I, when I was mustering cattle, I wasn't just mustering. I was sweeping the floor. I was digging holes. I was driving the tractor. I was doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and that's where you've got to be prepared to do that sort of thing, those jobs just to, to get in there and, um, and get the hours up. One thing I tell you is do not do, don't go and say, hey, I'll work for free to get hours. Don't do that because that just undermines um, how hard you have worked to get that qualification and you'll be exploited for it. And uh, that just sets a bad precedent because then uh, operators think they can do that. Um, but yeah, just, just, you just gotta put yourself out there and be ready to sweep the hangar floor, be ready to wash it. Oh, I've got a dollar for every hour I washed an airplane. You got to just got to do that sort of thing, and that's just the way it is. Um, but enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Um, that's the the biggest thing I point. But most importantly, um, don't give up, and don't go out. You know, trying to make yourself into something you're not. I used to see these ridiculous resumes that had come in when I was with um, with uh, NGA. You know, trying to talk themselves up. These guys might have had 150 hours in a bare commercial, but talking themselves up like they are an A380 captain with 30 years experience. You're at the bottom of the pile. Be honest. And accept that and you and, and and work with it so but um, just trying to blow your trumpet into something you're not isn't going to work um but yeah be honest be humble and just don't give up thank you thank you so much Brian. Chef Sporrell writes uh, questions is there a possibility of a, a plane going down due to bad turbulence oh uh, yeah if the procedure is not followed correctly now the procedure is what you call turbulence penetration so every airplane has a, um, a, a published turbulence penetration speed or um, what they call the VB speed. So you want to be back at that. If you're hitting severe turbulence, you want to be back at that speed so that the airplane can be struck by turbulence, but 
the as the stresses increase, it's it's dropped. If you're going too fast, it won't relieve those stresses, and that's where you can have problems. So um, we're always avoiding um, big cumulus buildups or storm buildups because that's where the turbulence is particularly bad. So you um, you have to avoid those. And um, if you've got to, sometimes you can't. You just got to pick the point of least resistance through them, and uh, then just do the uh, the turbulence penetration back to, to turbulence penetration speed and fly the airplane that way. Make sure the seatbelt sign switched on. Okay, thank you so much. I know. For I, know I don't know. Is Gav still with us? Um, uh, not at the moment. No. no, I know. Yeah, Gav doesn't like turbulence. I know that much. He doesn't like turbulence. <laughs> we have Sonia Nakpal raising her hand. Hi, Sonia. If you could just unmute yourself. And just um, share your queries with us. Thank you. Hi, Anush, and hi, Kren. So, hi, Sonia. Uh, very inspiring story, Kren. Oh, um, you. you have a purpose to life. So, um, my question I, I have two, three connecting questions. So, first of all, I did see you taking the school children to the workplace, and I, I understand showing them how things work. So, do you connect with the schools and then the children come there? Did you, how, how did you start? So, I mean, you, that would require a lot of funding and so on, right? To start the place and maybe have the children there. And what kind of learning, uh, uh, you know, uh, children would have? Yeah, friend. Okay, so in terms of the, the photograph she saw of um, the children in the workplace, um, that, that's work in context. Like that, that was in Brisbane where I lived. And I, I, you know, I've got contacts from my career and um, I just organised to take them through the workplace. I don't take a lot of young people through the workplace because it is takes a lot to get organised. But when I see young people who are particularly focused and really wanting to move ahead, um, I go the extra mile and take them through. Um, that, that was through the Royal Flying Doctor Base. I've taken through Black Sky Aerospace and also through the Airbus helicopters. Um, I just work contacts to organise that. Um, where I do the education component is when I look at the curriculum and for instance, forces is a classic one for the lower middle primary years in Australia. So you're talking about contact forces, non-contact forces, uh, those sorts of things. So, and that can be very easily demonstrated with, with our rockets. Uh, I do angles. Um, my launch pads are designed with a protractor so we can vary the angle. We vary the amount of water we put in these rockets. So a big emphasis on the fair testing model and seeing how that affects the amount of water affects the rocket flight, uh, how the angle affects it. I even do probability and statistics with rockets. Um, sorry, I don't have it with me here. Um, we have a big target, which is broken up into quadrants. And then all the kids fire their rockets and they've got to try and hit the target. I mean, what little person doesn't like doing that? And then we count how many land in each quadrant. We tally that up and then we crunch the numbers back in the classroom uh, on probability and statistics. So living and non-living, we launch, uh, we make a little micro environment with a, a plastic bag, a tissue and a little bean seed. We launched that because the first biological things to go to space were corn seeds and fruit flies. Most people think of like the dog, but it was actually fruit flies were the first animals to go to space. And so we recreate those sort of things and just use the water rocket as the vehicle to connect to the curriculum. Fantastic. That's really amazing, Prin. I wonder if we have something like this here in India. I would like to take my children and learn uh, all these concepts. Thank you so yeah. very much. Um, well, I know the in Indian um, Space Research Organization, ISRO, is um, getting quite, um, quite proactive. So um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get over there. But um, and like I say, we're also working on being able to ship our equipment. And it's very simple, very easy to use. And the only thing you need to get is a soft drink bottle. That's the one thing, thank goodness, soft drink bottles are standard around the world. Um, and um, a bicycle pump, that's all you need. And then you can be flying rockets. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you, Gran. Uh, we do have another question from Emmanuel Appiah. He writes, hi, Gran. Will STEM education in the digital environment overtake physical books or physical classroom one day? Oh, that that's a loaded question. Um, I I don't think entirely. I don't think entirely. I would like to see hands-on STEM embraced a whole lot more. I really would. I mean, I have very very few children who don't don't get connected, who don't become engaged when I'm I'm launching rockets, um, particularly in the younger years. And I, I 
the really little people are my favourites. The foundation year, so from uh, five to the age of about nine are my favourites because they haven't learnt to fail. They still embrace failure. They don't care if it doesn't work. They'll just keep going. They'll have another go most of the time. So emphasising that throughout the, uh, the later years, I think it's going to be very important. Um, I think we still need, we still need the blackboard. Uh, unfortunately, these things are here to stay. So we're going to have to really embrace those as well. Um, however, particularly in Australia, I, I don't know if there's many other Australian teachers on. I personally think that the using so-called smart devices has gone way too far one way. We've got young people who just do not have the basic fundamental education points. They've missed so much. And you've got kids who can't tell me what half of 60 is without a calculator. Uh, I mean, that, that to me, I think is incredibly, incredibly sad. Um, and they have to absolutely default to Google. They're not de developing those problem solving skills. So we have to find a balance. So yes, I'd like to see STEM engaged, uh, utilized a whole lot more. However, I still think that classroom and information part is still going to be important. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Maya, for your question. We do have Rinkar Mishra uh, asking, is there any aim of its rocket science? It's, it's very unclear. If you could unmute yourself, Rinkar, uh, is it possible for you to unmute yourself and ask your question to Grant himself? Good evening, sir. I have the question that uh, is there is any aim of uh, its rocket science? Oh, hello, mate. How are you? This is my mate Hiranka from on, on LinkedIn. How are you, buddy? Good morning, sir. You're good. That's good. Great to hear it, mate. What's your question, pal? Sir, is there is any aim of uh, its rocket science? Well, my aim is to rocket science is to get more young people like you interested in rockets. That's what my goal is, my friend. That's my goal is to show young people like you how amazing you can be. And you know, I mean, you're an incredibly switched on young man. I see some of the maths you do on LinkedIn and they're like, oh, you're so far ahead of me. It's ridiculous. I'm just a pilot. I'm, you're a mathematician. But my aim and my goal is to show young people like you how amazing you can be. And you've got an amazing skill set. And you don't have to use these things all the time. You don't have to use smart devices. You've got a great smart device between your ears, mate. That's the one I need to show young people how to use. And I mean, I don't have to convince you, you're already amazing, but um, that's, that's my goal. That's my aim is to get young people excited about learning and to show them they can be amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Ranko. Thank you for your question. And thank you for your answering, Grant. We do have Gavin questioning. Grant, I'm scared of flying. I fly all the time, but I cannot get over my fear. I can't stand on stage in front of 10,000 people without being scared. But as the plane goes through turbulence, my palms get sweaty. What advice would you give to anyone who is scared of flying like me? Well, you need to come flying with me, Morgan. That's what we need to do. It, understanding it. That's, that's what the thing is. If, if you, I mean, I know we've been talking about it for some time for you to come up to Brisbane and we'll go flying. If you understand what is going on, and knowing you, you're perfectly, you're, you're safe. There's, there's nothing. The aeroplane is designed. Actually, what you could do is uh, look up on YouTube when they do stress testing on new aircraft wings. I know there's one Boeing had some years ago, and they were testing this wing, and it had to make it to a certain point. And anyway, so it was they, they, they stressed it and stressed it and stressed it, and it got to the point. Anyway, at that point, they were successful. They knew they'd achieved their goal. But they can't use that wing now because it had been so very damaged. So they, they kept pushing it to see how far it went before it broke. And it was up like this before it snapped, which would never, ever happen in the real aeroplane. It's absolutely impossible for those sort of stresses to occur on the real aircraft. So when you look at those videos and you see how much effort it takes to break an aeroplane, it, it, you will... I think that's what would then give you an appreciation that the airframe itself is very, very safe and that the pilots are also um, trained in dealing with uh, severe turbulence. And there's a procedure in place called um, turbulence penetration. And it's where we bring the speed back. And so the aeroplane just rides that turbulence rather than slamming into it, it rides it. And yeah, okay, it's not particularly fun. It's not particularly comfortable for anyone. However, the aeroplane is very safe and it's not going to get damaged. 
it to get on the ground, refuel and go on its next flight. So just understanding how well those aeroplanes are designed and what they really could take if they had to. Yeah, it's pretty much, look up that video on Boeing, it's pretty amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Cran. Thank you, Gavin, for your question. He says, I need to fly with Cran. Absolutely, mate. you got to come to Brisbane. <laughs> Shia Rosinda's writes, writes an um, amazing session. And Teresa Buki from Indonesia writes, thank you, Cran. And uh, I, before you go, Cran, we have uh, six minutes left and I do have one more question for you. Can I write ahead? For you. The question is, um, connecting technology uh, aircraft technology with education is not cost effective and uh, in your opinion how would you how would low income school address this issue uh, look I, I, I can appreciate that like you've got drone technology and all that sort of thing and, and that's amazing stuff uh, like my, my buddy in um, in Philadelphia Scotty Buell does amazing work with drones but it is expensive and honestly we know there's some schools who don't even have power so that's where <sighs> I am working with that to try and say, so Gavin, I, we've got some ideas we're going to be working on. And hopefully if I can get home for more than a day, I'll be able to start working on that where they can just use equipment, which they're finding in the drunk. You know, once they've got a launch pad and once they've got a, a pump, then they can build rockets with what they find quite literally in the recycling bin, that and a roller tape. Now, the other thing too, is you can build paper aircraft, paper planes. Now, while they're not a drone, the theory that holds them up is exactly the same, whether it be an Airbus A380 or whether it be a paper aeroplane, the theory of the aerofoil is exactly the same. Like you can, um, for instance, hang on, I'll see if I can demonstrate it. Thank you. Uh, where are we here? I'm just gonna get a, um, tear a page out of my notebook. Uh, oh. So, this isn't going to work too well, I don't think. But you can see how it's dragging down. But if you go there and and blow over the top, it's Bernoulli's principle. And it'll produce lift. So that's exactly how an aircraft wing works. It's just airflow over that curved surface, which reduces the amount of pressure, which then lifts the wing into the wind. So uh, you, can, you can do little uh, things like that. Like I say, the, the theory that holds them up is exactly the same. Uh, whether it be an Airbus 380 or whether it be a paper aeroplane. Um, you know, rubber bands, um, you can make, oh, heck, I've made model aeroplanes with pool noodles, that sort of thing. There's, there's lots of stuff you can do. Um, but in terms of the rocketry, um, yeah, I, I really want to get our product out there and be able to send it anywhere in the world. And I, my goal, and fortunately, I didn't get myself organized soon enough, but I wanted, when um, Gav uh, went to the North Pole, I wanted him to launch one of my rockets at the North Pole. But I didn't get myself organized early enough to have something ready for him. So we'll, uh, I want to see one of my rockets launched on every continent in the world. That'd be a goal I'd really like to see, I'd really like to achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grant. Thank you so much for your amazing session. And we are going to showcase Grant's uh, recording our, on our platform, educationinfluence.com, after the event. And please, please, please share your queries with us. Uh, and attach Google form, Google form link, and we will revert back as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Grant. Thank you. My pleasure, team. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, Gav, we'll, we'll be talking. I want to come down to see you guys in Melbourne pretty soon as well. I've got some ideas we've got to discuss. Very good. All right. Well, it is now um, seven thirty. Sorry, six thirty. No, sorry, seven thirty in in Western Australia. I haven't had any dinner yet, so I'm going to excuse myself. I hope everyone you, else has a really great evening. Have a lovely and dinner I'll... and have a lovely evening and have a lovely night. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right. Cheers now.